Good morning. My name is Maya and I'll be doing the Bible reading this morning. Um, This morning the passage comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Um, Please follow along with me in your Bibles. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, you'd like one, please raise your hand and one of our uh, staff members will provide you with one. Um, If you're following along in the church Bibles, the page number is 954. It's 954. In this passage, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church at Colossae about the nature of their new humanity as followers of Jesus. So that's Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Hey, how are we, 10.30? Good to see you all. If we haven't met, my name is James, one of the pastors here. Um, And as we dive into this big topic today, I'd love for you to pray with me that we'd ask that God would guide us and strengthen us and help us to respond well to his word. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this really special time that we have where we open your word and we hear you speak to us directly in the power of your spirit. So we ask that you would enable each of us to hear what we need to hear today, a challenge, an encouragement, an assurance, a comfort. We ask this, that our faith together in the Lord Jesus would grow and flourish. We ask this in his powerful name. Amen. Well, as Tim highlighted at the beginning, we are continuing in our series, Thick Religion. And this is a series where we're trying to dig deeper into the, some of the things that we do together that give us a thick experience of Jesus. Thick religion. It's rich. It's deep. It's beautiful. It reminds us that when we gather together on a Sunday, now I don't know whether coming here today for you was really easy and natural or whether it was really a big struggle and it was difficult. However you've come in here today, we're reminded that what we're doing is not a fad or a fashion, but we're part of the greatest story in the universe, God's story to redeem and transform the people who will enjoy him and worship him forever. That's what you've invested in today. And today we're looking at creeds, like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. Why do we say those? And so as we begin, I just want to ask you, what was your reaction as we said the Apostles' Creed before? Like what went on inside you? Did you feel like it was just a bit of dry habit? Or did you experience delight? Was there kind of an internal yawn? Or did you want to celebrate? Did you groan? Or did you feel gratitude? My story um, was that I grew up uh, in a home with mum and dad um, who loved and provided for my sister and I wonderfully. Uh, But it wasn't a Christian home, so we never went to church. 
Didn't even do the token Christmas and Easter thing that people sometimes do in the hills. Uh, and, and we only went to church for weddings and funerals. So essentially it had to be really happy or really sad to get us in a church building. That's how little we went to church. So when I became a Christian in year 12, I had no experience of church. I'd just been reading the Bible and discovering Jesus. And so when I came to a church meeting and the, 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 the stand, sit, stand, sit, say a creed and an old-fashioned prayer, it just didn't make sense to me. I kind of felt like, well, we've got the Bible. Why not just stick with the Bible? That's how I felt, kind of like no creed but the Bible. Because creeds are one step removed from the Bible, aren't they? So why not just stick with the Bible? No creed but the Bible. But even in saying that, that is a creed. To say, I have no creed, I have no belief, but the Bible is a creed, is a belief. And that's the thing. Everyone has a creed. Everyone has a big picture, a story that helps them make sense of their lives and the world and history. And so I don't know if you saw this a little while ago in the United States, people started displaying their creed in their front window or on their front lawn. And so this was the first kind of one that really got things going. In this house, we believe, see, there's a creed. Black lives matter, women's rights are human rights, no human is illegal, science is real, love is love, kindness is everything. It's a very strong statement of a worldview, isn't it? And so, of course, as human nature, you do something like that, people have to mock you. Um, and so this is the one that came out after that. We believe the legal thriller, Michael Clayton, starring George Clooney and others, is a vastly underrated cinematic experience. Uh, one of the greatest movies of all time, or the top five of the 21st century, if you can read a little writing. So people have to mock, right? And then uh, came the Christian uh, creed as well that was put on people's lawns. We believe God created man and woman. Love is sacrificial. God created science. Not a few or some, but all lives matter. An unborn life is still a life. Helping the immigrant, judging character, not skin color, respecting the law and the flag. And that last bit, the flag tells you it's an American thing, right? Respect the flag. <laughs> Uh, see, everyone has a creed. Everyone has a, a, a big picture, a worldview that shapes how they think about the world. That's, that's what we do. And, and Christian creeds, like the Apostles' Creed that we said before and the Nicene Creed, try to help us grab and live with a God-centered uh, picture of the world, a Bible-shaped big picture of the world, a Jesus-glorifying, spirit-filled shape to the big picture of our lives. That's what creeds do. They help us in that way. So today we're going to look at three things. Creeds are a beautiful expression of faith. Secondly, losing our creeds is dangerous. Thirdly, creeds are a powerful display of community. So firstly, creeds are a beautiful expression of faith. Let me tell you a story. Uh, when we were serving in a church down in the south of Sydney, um, there was a couple there who'd gone as missionaries to the Philippines, Howard and Michelle Newby. Uh, and they'd gone not to the main cities, but they'd gone out to the rural villages uh, where people out there kind of have, um, they described as sort of this folk Christianity. So they believe in Jesus, but they also believe that the spirits everywhere all around you all the time who are either trying to attack you or bless you, and you've got to kind of placate them or appease them to, to get things in life and avoid curses and so on. And so what Howard and Michelle uh, did is they started to write these very simple uh, explanations of Jesus, in, and they got a a local boy, a teenage boy, kind of year eight age, to translate them into the local dialect for them. Now, as that was happening, God did this thing that God often does. As that teenage boy was translating, he discovered Jesus and became a Christian. He loved that. And he was so excited, he told Howard and Michelle that when I walk home tonight, I don't need to be, and I walk through the jungle, I don't need to be afraid of the spirits trying to attack me because I know Jesus is powerful. And Jesus will protect me. He loved that. He's got himself a little beginner's creed. Jesus is powerful. Jesus will protect me. And he'll love that when Jesus breaks into someone's life like that with power and goodness. And you know what? The New Testament is full of this. You read it in the Gospels again and again as Jesus intervenes in someone's life. You read in the book of Acts, as thousands upon thousands of people turn to Jesus and are transformed by him. And then you get to the, the letters written by Paul and Peter to the, the churches, these fragile new churches all over the, the Roman world. In Rome, in Corinth, in Galatia, in Ephesus, in Colossae, in uh, Thessalonica, and all over the modern, what is now modern Turkey. 
And as you read those letters, I don't know how many times you've read them, but Paul and Peter do this kind of really beautiful thing. I don't know if you noticed this. They start and end their letters with the grace of God. Have you noticed that? They bookend, they frame the letters, they wrap these letters up in the grace of God. Have you noticed this? Because they're giving these fragile new Christians a a creed, a, a big picture for their lives. It says, your story is wrapped up in the grace of God. That God is good and he's a giver. And he's given salvation as a free gift. And he will never leave you or forsake you. He is for you. He is with you. He has wrapped up your life in his grace. Amen, church? So what Paul and Peter are doing is giving these new Christians a creed, a big picture for their lives. And then as you dive deeper into each of these letters, you see them doing that again and again. So we read Colossians chapter 1 earlier. And Paul's writing to this church in Colossae, fragile new believers, and their culture around them is kind of telling them, look, there's a richer spirituality without Jesus. Kind of sounds like our day, doesn't it? And so Paul, one of the things Paul does in the letter is he reminds them who Jesus is. He says, let me tell you about Jesus again. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now there's a lot in there, but you see it again. He says, all, everything, all, everything. Whatever you can think of that's been created in the world, Jesus made it. It was made for him and by him. He is the center of all things. He holds all things together. So Paul's saying to these fragile Christians, here's your creed. Jesus is bigger and better than anything you could imagine. So don't settle for anything less than him. And then he reminds them, verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Gee, that's beautiful, isn't it? If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel, the same thing that you've heard is being proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. He says, you have been drawn into God's big story as his holy people. See what creeds do? They're not dry formulas that we just kind of stand up and recite, but they help us remember and take hold of the fact that we are part of God's big redemption story. So it's really dangerous then if we lose our creeds. Israel's history shows this. God gave them a creed. Remember when they were rescued out of slavery in Egypt? And God gathers them to himself, and then he gathers them, and he tells them this in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And he goes on, verse 21. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves in Pharaoh, of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. That was their creed that God gave them. That the God that they followed was the true and living God, that he had rescued them out of slavery in Egypt, and they were his people, and they were to follow in his ways. And we saw there, didn't we? God commanded them not to forget this, to talk about it all the time together, to write it even on their clothes and the door frames of their houses. Let that creed, that big picture, shape their world. But, and to spoiler alert, if you've never met, read the Old Testament, again and again they forgot this. For example, Judges chapter 3, verse 7, God says, well, the Bible says, Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot 
the Lord their God and serve the Baals and Asherahs, false gods, idols. It doesn't mean when it says that they forgot, it didn't mean that they had memory loss. They forgot that there was a God. No, they neglected him. It's a bit like if you forget your mum's birthday or you forget to call her on Mother's Day. Anyone done that? It's a safe place. It's okay. No judgment. Maybe this will help. Um, a friend of mine who may or may not be on staff here at Norwest, <laughs> may or may not be the senior minister of this church. <laughs> Let's just call him P. Stedman. Um, <laughs> he was telling me a while ago that uh, one year he rang his mum on her birthday not to wish her happy birthday because he'd forgotten, but the conversation went like this. Hi, Mum, how are you? Great, that's awesome. Um, wondering if you could mind the kids next week. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, I'll catch you later. It was only a couple of days later that he remembered her birthday. Ever done that? See, I told you it's a safe place. Can't be worse than that, right? <laughs> See, when you forget your mum's birthday, it's not that you forget that you have a mum or that she has a birthday or what that birthday even is. Someone asks you, say, oh, it's the 10th of August or whatever it is. No, when you forget your mum's birthday, is that somehow in your heart and mind you've neglected her that her birthday is a lower priority in your busy schedule. It's not to judge anyone, that's just kind of what happens. And that's kind of what happened with Israel. It wasn't that they forgot there was a God, but they turned away from him, they neglected him, and his story then no longer shaped their lives. So Ezekiel 22 is really telling on this, talking about the people of Jerusalem. In you are a people who accept bribes to shed blood. You take interest and make a profit from the poor. You extort unjust gain from your neighbors, and you have forgotten me, declares the Lord. Do you see that? All kinds of evil and cruelty and wickedness because they forgot the Lord and his big picture, his creed for their lives. Sure, they still went to temple. They still did the sacrifices. They could still recite the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, but they had lost their creed, their story, their identity as God's people. It is a really dangerous thing to lose our creeds. We've seen it in the last little while in the worldwide church, haven't we? All the stories of the Church of England around the world. They've stopped teaching the Bible. People no longer know what to believe. Do we believe that Jesus really rose from the dead, that sexuality and gender, we just make it up, or has God got a view on it? Like, did Jesus really die? Is he the Savior? And the church withers and dies. I remember a few years ago uh, when I was at Bible college, um, talking with a family who joined the church where I was a student minister, and they'd come from a different denomination, and they'd left that denomination because their pastor was no longer teaching that Jesus is the King and Savior of the world. And it was really painful for them because they had four or five generations in that church had come through, and so it was devastating to have to leave. And I remember them talking with them, and they said, with tears in their eyes, they said, like, how did this happen? How did it come to this? And as we talked more and more, it became clear that their denomination had stopped teaching the Bible. They'd let culture shape what they should think. They'd lost their big picture, their creed. It's a dangerous thing to lose our creeds. It leads down some dark and distorted paths. And so we need our creeds because what they do is they help us have that big picture. But you might be thinking, okay, so... Why not just stick with the Bible? Like, if, as you said, James, the New Testament is full of all these creeds. Why not just have that? No creed but the Bible. Um, because we're all at risk of doing something. doesn't matter how long you've been in church or not, whether you've been to Bible college or not. We're all at risk of, letting, of just reading the Bible through our own cultural grid or with our favorite herd of hobby horses in tow. So, for example... Um, in our day and age, we find the parts of the Bible that talk about God's wrath and his judgment, that we should fear the Lord. We find those really a bit uncomfortable. And so we prefer to read, we prefer to lean into God is loving, God is gracious, God is kind. And in a Western culture, we are very individualistic. And so what we tend to do is read the Bible very personally. What does it say to me? What does it mean for me? What's God's purpose for me? And we're less likely to lean into the fact that God's purpose for the world is corporate. He wants to gather a people, a church together. You see, we're all at risk of just reading the Bible through our cultural lens with our favorite hobby horses in tow. 
But what formal creeds do, like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, is they keep putting God's big picture before us and lifting us out of that. So we're going to have a look at the Nicene uh, Creed together. Not line by line, that would be a whole other sermon. We're just going to scan through and notice some things. So first, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. So baseline, that's reminding us that this world is not an accident. And you are not an accident. There's one God who created all things. And he's not cold and distant from us, but he is our Father. And so we read on. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. We know that Jesus is not a fairy tale. He's not just a teacher or a healer or a prophet or just a good man, but he's the eternal son of God who came into our world to rescue us, to die on a cross and rise from the dead. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. This world doesn't just kind of go on some endless cycle of repetition, but there is a purpose and a goal, the return of Jesus to put all things right. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We're not alone. We have God's spirit in us, a gift from the Father and the Son. We believe in the holy, universal, and apostolic church. And this is beautiful because it reminds us, not just Norwest Anglican or the church, Anglican Church of Sydney, but we have brothers and sisters all over the world, Africa and Asia and the Pilbara and South America and Southeast Asia and North America and the United Kingdom, and not just in this time and space, but throughout history, everyone who believes So we have brothers and sisters who grew up and lived and died in the Roman Empire and in medieval Europe and in the Industrial Revolution because we're part of God's church. And we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I'm going to throw something out here, be a little bit bold. You ready? You sinned this week. I sinned this week. We all sin this week, like every week. And this week, there is forgiveness of sins. Remind each other of that, that God is always forgiving and gracious and kind. And we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That even though death is cruel and horrible, it does not have the final word. We look for resurrection and the life to come. Amen. That's what creeds do, you see. They take us out of our blinkered view of the world, whatever kind of framework we've got ourselves into, and they keep lifting us to God's big picture and reminding us of that. And so there's one more thing that we need to celebrate together today. There was a phrase that was repeated a number of times in the Nicene Creed. Just two words. Anyone want to take a guess at what that was? 8.30 got it, so no pressure. We believe. Yes, it's different to the Apostles' Creed. That's interesting. You can ask me about that later. But we believe. What that says, when we stand together and we say we believe, we're saying we believe this together, that we belong together, and you belong here as God's people. And that's really important because as we look around a church in this day and age, some of you will be going really well. You're in a great season of life, and we praise God for that. Some of you are not going so well. There's mental health, chronic illness, loneliness. Maybe there's something going on at work or in your marriage or in your family. And it's just really hard, and you know you're just keeping your head above water, barely. And then some of you are not going well, not going bad. It's just kind of okay. There's no crisis, nothing kind of terrible, but you think, well, I'm just kind of plodding along. I feel like that I'm missing something, some purpose, some direction, something, I don't know, I'm just kind of plodding along. But when we stand and we say the creed together, we're saying that whatever's going on, we all belong. You belong. And that's not to downplay whatever struggles are in your life and say, well, just get over it because of the creed. No, that's real and raw. 
But when we stand and we say we believe, we're reminding ourselves that there is something bigger, something better, something richer, something greater. No matter how successful you are or how much of a failure you feel, you belong. You belong. That together we're all part of God's story. And we say that together because we all need to hear it from each other. We need to hear those words, those truths from each other, to encourage each other, to share in that together. And so friends, church, brothers and sisters, I want you to invite you to stand together. And we're going to celebrate together, not mumble through, but hear it loudly together, that we all belong that we're all part of God's story together. And I see in Creed. Together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As you remain standing and the band comes up, let me pray for us all. Father God, we thank you for these truths that we have celebrated together today, and we thank you that you give us these big stories to speak over our lives. We ask that as a church, we would hold firm to these, we would not lose these creeds, but we would remember and celebrate, and that we would share in them together as a wonderful statement of our belonging as your people. We ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Amen.